Hey everyone, Matthew LaCroix here, and welcome to the second podcast in a new series I've started called Mastermind Discussions, where we'll talk about the secrets of ancient history, the nature of reality, and the multiverse. Today, I'm joined by podcaster and researcher Jeffrey Wilson from The Conspiracy Farm, and he's going to sit down and discuss with me some of these incredible topics. Jeffrey, tell a little people a little about yourself and how you got down this path. Well, thank you, my man, Matthew LaCroix, and Happy New Year. It is an absolute beyond pleasure. When I saw you had this show going, I was like, oh, my goodness, dude. I've been waiting for this. Obviously, I've been a huge fan of yours. You've been on the Conspiracy Farm, like you said, a podcast that I co-host with UFC Hall of Famer Pat Miletic. And, um, you know, it's so beyond timely that we kind of relinked up. We, You know, we're going to link back up and have a show and stuff, but I'm telling you, and we're going to not necessarily get into so much of that, but why I'm so glad to be having this conversation with you, because, you know, our show, we get so much and so deep into the geopolitical nonsense, the WWE, just the craziness, and it creates this kind of white noise that we all get caught up in. But as we've talked about all the time, it's all symptomatic of basically the eagle versus the serpent that we all talked and we talked about so long ago. And so I'm glad I've really been kind of been thinking about you and, and your, your book, Stage of Time and getting back to that to not get so caught up in taking the Pepsi challenge all the time of Pepsi versus Coke. Absolutely. And thank you for the acknowledgement. My goodness, dude, my first acknowledgement. I mean, that just blew me away, bro. So um, again, thank you for having me on. And I'm really stoked to have this conversation with you, my man. And uh, again, happy new year and congratulations on the new podcast. Hey, thanks so much, my friend. I always enjoy sitting down and having these conversations with you. How did um, you go down this path to start? You know, what's your story about getting into ancient history and conspiracies, and how did it all begin for you? Well, conspiracies, generally speaking, man, and I kind of, it, this hit me like about five years ago. I, as a kid, I went into the library and I read, I just kept going past this book called Assassination, and I opened the book. You know, I, I'm not, well, I wasn't back in the day necessarily a big reader, but flipping through that book called Assassination, the visual, I saw these images of John F. Kennedy and uh, Martin Luther King at the Lorraine Motel or Robert Kennedy on the floor in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. And it just, it, it planted a seed. And later on down the line, I was one night watching a documentary called Reasonable Doubt. Uh, and it was just a documentary on the Kennedy assassination. And for me, it just planted that seed of like, how could there be a question about the death of the president? Like, Usually, if, if I were to shoot you, Matt, they'd find me, find out how it happened, and the whole night. But it just seemed to be very uh, dubious under the circumstances, and that started me down a huge rabbit hole that opened me up to these alternative thought processes. And then back in the day, I loved Coast to Coast and Art Bell, and he would have on people like Jim Mars or Graham Hancock or uh, Ed Dames, and it was just, and that was where I first heard of the Anunnaki. So then for me, it was like, oh my goodness. There's something else going on here. And just as things have gone on, I've just had way more questions than answers. And books like yours, The Illusion of Us, The Stage of Time, it's really, really, I'm serious, man. And I mean this a lot. It's really, really helped me put these ancient puzzle pieces together. And hopefully today's conversation um, continues to help do that. Thanks. I really appreciate those kind words and show of support. Um, isn't it interesting that it seems like we have to have this one moment where we, we say, wow, ah, look, something is not like we've been told. And then from that point on, it sort of goes down this rabbit hole of, you say, well, you know, if this isn't what I've been told, the, the way that I've read in school or been told by parental figures, then what is the real story? And as you, as you go down, you start to see there's more and more things that we have to reevaluate and relook at once again, right? Well, and then, and then you look at it like, you know, movies like The Matrix. And I say all the time, The Matrix is a documentary because as we go on and we learn more and more about these things that aren't what they're supposed to be, it's, they've created an artificial, I'm going to say they, I hate to use that word, an artificial reality has been created over reality. And, you know, people like you and I who question these things, you know, we're crazy, we're conspiracy theorists, we're, you know, it's, we're just critical alternative thinkers because as we've seen, a lot of things have been, you know, obscured from us and hidden from us. And, 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 you know, it comes to those assassinations and all these different political, geopolitical things. But as you get into, and as religion gets into and all this esoteric, how did we get here? Who are we? That is like the biggest question we all have. And honestly, you know, I believe these civilizations have come and gone many of times. But when you go back to these conversations, like we're going to talk about today, these ancient cities, 
it's there. It's hidden in plain sight. And then we get into, well, why is it hidden? And gee, look at all the places we're at war in right now. Hmm. And that's where the rabbit hole starts, right? And well, where, yeah. And, and you're tumbling down begin. it. Yeah. That's where we're going to begin. So today's show is going to focus on mankind's forbidden origin story the Anunnaki, and especially Erdu, the first city on earth. We're going to look at, like what Jeffrey was saying, well, is there this entire lost chapter of human history? And is it being deliberately suppressed and hidden from our, from our awareness because of what it could do to the entire narrative of human history and how we perceive our story in the past? And I, I know that if, you know, people will, will go and they'll look up Eridu and they'll see, oh, it's, you know, it's 3,500 BC, it was built and it was in Mesopotamia. And it's just, it's just along the lines of all these other cities we've heard of that, that it came out of the Fertile Crescent. Well, the evidence that we're about to show today and some of the tablets we're going to review really just puts that entire um, narrative on its head. And we have to reevaluate and look at, well, maybe some of these cities are part of entirely different dynasties and different epics of human history that have come and gone from disasters and war and all these different aspects that have really impacted how we perceive our past. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be reviewing four different cuneiform tablets that not only talk about Eridu, but they talk about mankind's early origin story and you know where this whole biblical Eden came in and Adam and, and also how some of these ancient kings could have lived as long as they did and, and where this entire story of humanity came from. So, and I know people like Jeffrey are, you know, hunting down the trail for this kind of information because of how much it changes our perspective when we read about it. Because it's one thing to have someone just bark information at you and just tell you certain facts. But it's another thing when you get to either have them read the information directly from some of these ancient texts or even going to verify it yourself and reading it. And that's what I want people to do today. So, Jeffrey, the first place that we're going to start is we're gonna set the stage for, well, what is the significance of some of these ancient cities? You know, where, how old are they? You know, who ruled there? And, and why are these cities all lumped together in these, in these dates that are, that are largely inaccurate? Hmm. And the first place we're gonna start is we're gonna break down some of these tablets that have given us this glimpse into the past. And for those who, who don't know, Mesopotamia, known as the Fertile Crescent, was where civilization first began. And I do agree with that. But what I don't agree with is the timeline for, for, that we're given for how old a lot of these ancient, we could call them post and pre-Diluvian civilizations are, and the distinction between them, and, and all the different kings that are ruled there, and all the empires that we've squashed together, and this narrative that only fills about 5,000 years of human history. But as we're about to see, that's only a tiny little glimpse into how old some of these some of these places actually are. So to start, Jeffrey, to really look at this, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, is we're going to start with the Sumerian king list, and that's the one that probably the most most of the individuals are familiar with. And it it's it opens up by stating, when the kingship was lowered from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. Okay. And then it goes on to list the different kings that ruled there, these astronomically long time, time periods that they ruled for. Now, Jeffrey, when you, when you see some of those ages and seeing kings that lived for hundreds of years, potentially thousands of years ruling over these places, wouldn't that paint, automatically paint the picture of a completely different time period in human history, would you say? Without a doubt. Without, I mean, the Sumerian Kings list is actually one of my favorites because it's so, uh, it's so the hard evidence of, I mean, not only are these people's reigns tens of thousands of years, their lives. I mean, obviously something was going on some level of life extension technology. I mean, it was just a whole other script, obviously, we're talking about if you're living that long. Yeah, and, it's, it, it, and that's what we're going to get into is how that could have been possible and, and why today we see such a, a vast difference in our, you know, the, the amount of time we can live for. So right. the, the Sumerian king list goes on to list many other cities such as Bad Tiberia and Sarupak and all these other cities. But today what we're really going to be focusing on is on Eridu and a city called Uruk. Because these two cities play a very important role in the origin story of mankind and where all of this began. So 
in, in the Eridu Genesis to continue the next tablet, it starts by saying, and I'm giving this preface to, to show the importance of Eridu and where it fits into this whole thing. Eridu Genesis is a cuneiform tablet, basically, just like the Sumerian king list. For those who don't know, cuneiform is a style of writing where you can etch in symbols and letters into either, either rock or clay, and then you can essentially put it into hot ovens and turn it into this, hot, this type of brick hard material that can withstand thousands of years of time. And it really is the only way that you can sustain a message that can carry on all the way into the future. And think about it. If they were going to these tremendous lengths to write down these, these stories about these ancient cities and the, and the gods that ruled there and this, these early stories of where, how mankind was so much different than it is now, why would they do that unless it was significant and important? Because in some cases, Jeffrey, we're talking about tablets that were then given and handed over to civilization after civilization after civilization, and they protected it and they carried it on. So when we think of something like the Babylonians or the Assyrians, that's actually a much later empire that, that went and, and went to find these tablets to protect them. Give you an, a quick example. The, one of the great kings and rulers of um, Assyria was known as Ashurbanipal. And when he was ruling, even then, these tablets were ancient. That's what I want people to wrap their heads around. He actually went out because he was uh, a man who studied a lot of this information because he wanted to protect <clears throat> this, this wisdom. He uh, amassed a great army to go out and go capture and find all of these t tablets from all over Mesopotamia so he could put them in a great library and protect them. But that's what's so mind-blowing is that we're told that they're the ones who wrote them but they were actually going to find them buried in places and in, in old temples. And they were already ancient at that point. And that's the message I really want to get across. And so what, what the Eridu Genesis starts by saying, similar to the Sumerian king list, is it says, the firstling of the cities, Eridu, she gave to the leader Nudamid. Now, Jeffrey, Nunamid is, if you look up that name, was another one of these variants names used for Enki. And I'm sure you're well aware of, you know, who Enki is in all this story. But isn't that mind-blowing? Here's two tablets in a row that, ta that, that mention that Eridu is literally the first city on Earth. And we see, again, throughout time, whether it's the Sumerians or, I mean, Eridu or the Greeks or the Romans, we see this iteration of this Enki. You just have to be able to see the archetypal symbols, you know, the the... the the, the trident, if you will, um, Odin. I mean, that this has been transmuted throughout so many different times in history. I find it so, so very fascinating. But when you go back to the foundation of when it started, that's the bee's knees. Yeah, especially when you read it yourself and you, you say, wow. So he, here we have saying it's literally the first city ever handed down. And in the, in the case of um, the Sumerian king list, it says when the kingship was lowered from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. So not only does it tell you that Eridu is the first city, but it mentions that there are these divine principles and rules and this type of information that was specifically handed down for creating this entire civilization long ago. And the best place for us to link to really get into some fascinating information that expands on this is a new tablet that I'm gonna, I want to read and I want to break down with you, Jeffrey, and we'll go through this one slow. Because what I just read two little prefaces from two other tablets that I've mentioned many, many times, if you, if you know my work. But the one that I'm about to read, I've never discussed before and I've never read before. And as far as I know, I, I don't know if it's ever even been, been read before um, on a podcast. So it's exciting to think that people can hear these words for potentially the first time in thousands of years. And mm. I, I think that's really exciting. It's very cool. So the tablet that I'm referring to, and I, I highly encourage people to go check it out and read it because it's absolutely amazing. It's a cuneiform tablet that came out of Mesopotamia. But interestingly, it's the only tablet that I've ever seen that was also carried over and was found in Egypt as well. So this tablet has information that's so important that it's been carried by different empires and rulers throughout the world. And it's called Enbrakar in the Lord of Arata. To give a little information, Enmerkar was original king and builder of the Sumerian city of Uruk. Okay? And in, in the cuneiform tablets, when you read about him, it states that he ruled for 400 years. Is okay? that separate from Ur? Yeah, actually Ur is another city that's different than Uruk. Okay. They both have a similar name, but they're part of a completely different set of cities. 
And so it says he ruled for 400 years. And not only that, but some of the translations stated that he could have ruled for, for 900 in some places. So it's not like we're getting numbers all over the place. You know, oh, he ruled for, you know, 50 years or 100. No, it's, it's, it's translations are either that he ruled for 400 or 900 years. And his father, Mesh King Geshur, ruled, it stated he ruled for 325 years as part of the first dynasty of Iraq. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hmm. This, this isn't like just the Sumerian king list that's coming yeah. out and stating that these ancient rulers there ruled for these incredible amounts of time. Nor is it just the book of, of Enoch talking about how old he was and how long he was around for. But we're finding other tablets, Jeffrey, that are also stating that these dy dynastic rulers ruled for 400 to 900 years in some cases. Well, and again, go, I mean, I'm not a Christian necessarily, and I, we can get into a whole other conversation about the veracity of, you know, the Bible, et cetera. But I mean, Noah, wasn't he like 600 years? I mean, these guys, they're, they're putting up numbers even in biblical times. So, I mean, it just belies that larger question of like, how is this happening? And why are we choosing to ignore that? Just because we can only live for a maximum of 120 years now. What it, that doesn't mean that ancient humans weren't far different than we are. And that's mm. one of the things that we're going to get into and talk about. Freaks me out. So and, uh, in the tablet of En Merkar in the Lord of Arada, I'm going to read some sections of it that are really incredible, and then we're going to break them down. So it's, this tablet starts, and, I, and, my, and as people know if they've heard my shows, I always feel that, that the tablets, the beginnings of them are – can in many cases can be the most important at all because they set the setting and the time period for when the story began. And that automatically gives me some information to correlate and connect to other tablets to see, to correlate the information, to see and see how accurate they are. So the, and the, so the tablet starts by stating, in those days of yore, when the destinies were determined, the great princess allowed Anub to lift his head high now, Anug was another name for Eridu. That's why this is so important. Before the land of Demun yet existed, the Dianas of Anug and Kuluaba were well founded. Okay, so I'm going to break that down. That might be kind of confusing for some people, but let me. Yeah, explain. dude, definitely. So, in the beginning, I mentioned that the great princess allowed Anug to lift its head high. Well, as I said, Anug was another name for Eridu. And the princess that was referred to then was known as Inanna to the Sumerians. And in, in Babylon, she was known as Ishtar. Now, if you, if you do any, any research into ancient Babylon, you'll find that there's a, an incredible, important gate there called Ishtar Gate in Babylon, showing you the significance that these individuals played in ancient, ancient history. And now it mentions, it says, before the land of Del Moon yet existed, the Yanas of Anug and Kalamba were well-founded. Now, what is an Inanna? Well, if you look at, and just for people that want to know what that, how that's spelled, because I don't always read quite as well as I could on some of these ancient words, it is E-A-N-A -A and then apostrophe S. Now, what those were, it mentions the city of Anug in Kulaba. Anug, as I mentioned, was the name of, this, of Eridu. Now, Kulaba was the name of Uruk. Remember when I was connecting how the name of the tablet is M. Merkar in the Lord of Arada? It's because they're talking about the events that were going on between these two competing ancient cities and how they both had these gods that were worshiping over each of them and they were competing for dominance and the rulers there both thought they were divine rulers and that's where this whole thing began and and the tablet goes on to state may the lords of sumer the great mountain of the me of magnificent akkad in the whole universe may they all address enlil together in a single language for at that time enki lord of abundance and steadfast decisions the expert of the gods, chosen for wisdom, the lord of Eridu, shall change the speech in their mouths as many as he had placed there. And so the speech of mankind is truly one. Now, what does that bring up for references right there, talking about the division of the languages and everything? Does that ring up any bells to the Tower of Babel at all? Mm, more biblical, yeah. So the, the, the story of the Tower of Babel is this idea that mankind used to have a single language and it, and be, it became separated and divided. And that was one of the reasons why mankind became so divided because we were separated. Now, 
the story states essentially that Eridu and Uruk played very important roles in where these events were supposed to occur. And, and, and it makes total sense because the Tower of Babel is supposed to either be in Babylon or in Eridu. And what's interesting, though, is it states in the tablet that it's supposed to have unified the languages, but clearly that didn't happen. And it mentions Enlil directly in there. Address Enlil in one single language. But, but what happened? That's not what happened. Well, when you, Jeffrey knows when you, when you read these, a lot of these tablets and stories, you find out that Enlil really despised mankind. He did not want mankind to reach these higher levels. And instead of unifying the languages, they further divided them and they divided mankind. And it's, instead of being unified, we have just spent thousands and thousands of years of just fighting and, 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 being, and becoming divided. And I'm sure you could still see that today, Jeffrey, don't you? Without a doubt. I mean, when you, you said something about when we talked off air and you were uh, booking this show, you're like, what do you want to kind of want to talk about? Everything, uh, pretty much everything in general kind of we're discussing is the serpent versus the eagle, essentially, and how that manifests individually and idiosyncratically. I mean, we're talking, you know, like you said, all of these wars, et cetera, et cetera, the division between name it black, white, religion, you know, religiously, social and economically. Politically, obviously, I mean, it's just, um, and it's all by design. That's why it just bothers me so much is that it, it's, it's all by design and it goes back so, so very far. And we're not, I mean, we're going to get into it maybe a little bit tonight, but we're also going to be on Sam Tripoli's show talking a little bit more about other subjects, other individuals in the Persian Empire. It was called, I think, ecumenism at the time was basically blinging, trying to bring everybody belonging to a unified world. Um, and that's a whole nother conversation politically, how they, you know, one world government, et cetera, et cetera. But like you said, going back so, so very long, they were trying to unify. These were all elements of the, the, the ancient war of Enlil versus Inki. And this is just another manifestation of it. You're right. You're right. And so to, if, to bring some clarification to that, for people who don't know, when you look at cylinder seals and ancient records that go all the way back to the very beginning, Enlil and Enki had some very dis distinctive symbols they used to basically show their influences and to show their mentalities. And Enki always had this symbol of a serpent and the dragon, whereas Enlil always had this symbol of the eagle. And he was known as the Lord of the air, and Enki was known as the Lord of the fresh waters and earth. So essentially, you had this competition where each of these these beings, these Anunnaki beings that have woven their way through all of our ancient mythos and all of our ancient religions, it all essentially started from this competition because they essentially both had, were tasked with different roles within our reality. And like I said, Enlil's name literally means Lord of the Air. And he was known as Ashur, Ashur in Assyria. And, and Enki was known by many names. And one of the ones that, that Jeffrey knows and we'll talk about is he was called Ahura Mazda in Persia. But you can follow these traits and these individuals all throughout history. And what happened was because Enlil had despised mankind so much, and we'll get into why in a minute when we read the myth of Adapa. But when you get into why he, why he um, despised mankind so much, you can see how he became the one that essentially divided all the languages, divided mankind, confused them, put them into empire warring states to fight against each other constantly, and basically set us down this road of us just living in a state of confusion and division and distraction <clears throat> to try to hold us back from becoming the, our true selves and how great we really we really could become. And if, and if you don't mind me just like kind of not a disclaimer, but that doesn't mean you can't have pride in your ethnicity, your race, et cetera, et cetera. That is your life situation. That is not your life. Like Matt just alluded to, it's been a concentrated effort to utilize those things to define us on these levels when in fact, I mean, we're human before we're any of that stuff. And again, that's not to get into like, you know, you, one world government, no borders, because that's, that's kind of what I could easily hear people like, oh, you just, anyway, we're human before anything. And we can't allow these different mechanisms of division to divide us. But again, it goes back so far. It's so deep, man. It's so deep. Well, just imagine if we didn't have, and again, like you say, I really respect people's, um, you know, heritage and where they're from and, and the regions they come from. But if we didn't have 
hundreds and hundreds of languages being spoken all over the world, we would be more unified. And that, and I don't think that gets into, you know, necessarily just the pride of the region you come from, but we have to understand this goes back to the Tower of Babel and the idea that there once was a unified language where, where people were unified all on the same page. But when you divide them, you create conflict. And unfortunately, that's what we've seen throughout history is this conflict that, that emerged. Now, we, I mentioned Eridu, and we're talking about the significance of Eridu being the first city ever created. And in the, in the cuneiform tablet I just, I just read, I want to clarify, it mentions, it says, may the lands of Sumer and the great mountain of the Me of magnificence. You know, what is that? Well, the Me's, if people look into them, represent these decrees of the gods that were handed down, essentially like kingship, where certain locations are deemed significant and important, and, the, and literally these if gods, if you want to call them beings or whatever they are, superior beings that came into our reality and, and manipulated so many things and led to our own creation, they created these cities and they decreed certain individuals to basically take these commandments that they handed down on how society should rule and run and to follow them to the letter. And that's where all of this kingship came from, with these royal bloodline leaders that refused to want their bloodlines to be influenced by others so they would intermarry and all these issues that's where it all came from is the idea of trying to preserve a certain bloodline dynasty because you feel that it's superior over the rest and we're going to get into that in a second here but basically I, well i we'll get to the whole other conversation about eugenics etc but no you're absolutely correct and these are the same individuals who are implementing these kind of eugenics things that are pervading the world today it hasn't changed at all. When you look at some no. of these royal families that are still around today, you know, the ancient name of Sinclair that eventually um, connected to the Rothschilds and all of these ancient family lineages that go all around the world. And there are many of these ancient names they, um, that have been carried over. Many of them are still rulers of our world and still control great amounts of power of, uh, over others. Um, so and getting into the, the city of Eridu. When you read about in the Sumerian king list, like I said, it says, when the kingship was lowered from heaven, kingship was in Eridu. And it was essentially ruled over by Aluim. Now in that, it mentions that Aluim ruled for an extensive period of time. But what's also interesting is it mentions this character called Adapa. And that's where the next set of tablets is going to start, is this idea of, well, what is the, the, the story of mankind's origins? Are we just this Darwinian evolved ape that came along? Well, if we're just an evolved ape, then why do we still see apes all over the world that mm -hmm. haven't gone through mm -hmm. any change at all? You know, th there aren't just individuals that are exploring the Congo and find some silverback that has started to change into a human. That doesn't happen. We've never documented anything like that in human history, and yet we're told that we're just simply evolved apes. That's it. That's the whole story of what we are. And then we became apes that then became slowly became Neanderthals and Denisovians and then Homo sapiens sapiens came along and then here we are. But that's not what ancient records tell us. That's right. not what these stories say at all. And if anything, we have been forcefully de-evolved to a state where we forget our divinity and the wisdom that we used to have to make us seem like we're just animals fighting in a- I like that, state. forcefully de-evolved, because that's essentially what it is. I mean, like you said, I mean, this notion of history was this linear thing, like we were these knuckle dragon, whatever, and now we're so cool now, a bunch of idiots with smartphones. It's insane because the ancient text is, you, know, you just said, you can go back and read, it just proves otherwise. We're still wondering how the pyramids were built, let alone stuff that, you know, <laughs> the Eridu, it's... Let alone our origins, right? Yes. And, but again, it's force-fed. I mean, it's... I always thought, I mean, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to digress too much, but this kind of force-feeding, this, this conditioning, this kind of trauma-based conditioning, I think of like the Inquisition and like the Spanish going, coming over to, you know, the native people in these areas. And now look at today, and I'm not, it's not a disrespect, but like you see most cats most Mexican, or it's like the Virgin Mary, all these adornments of the things that through the Inquisition, how many, the both Inquisitions, how many people were killed during that? But that kind of indoctrination, if you don't believe in Catholicism, we're basically going to kill you. You do that over the course of generations. Look what's going to happen. You're not going to question it and you're going to believe it and put it all over your body, et cetera. And again, no disrespecting, but that's the kind of 
in my opinion, and I could be wrong, that kind of trauma-based uh, programming and engineering that happens to people, and you wind up adorning the uh, accoutrement of your oppressor, if you will. Well, look at what the flag is of Mexico. Again, not to digress, but we could just briefly mention it. I mean, you have a place where some of the most ancient ruins of all of the Americas are located, you know, from the Aztecs all the way to the Mayans down to the Olmec. And what happened? Their, the, their flag shows a, an eagle basically eating a serpent or holding it in place and conquering it. And, and I can't even count how many times I've seen the Mexican flag. And through, honestly, bro, again, kudos to you and all your work. That was like, whoa, understanding that whole eagle versus serpent. When I saw it, I'm just like, wow. And I'm sure you're, as you were about to probably allude to before I rudely interrupted you, you see it on all these different flags. You see the eagle dominating the serpent. I mean, in so many different incarnations of kind of political symbology and imagery. And it goes back to that ancient stuff. I mean, check out Matt's work on St. Patrick's Day. It'll blow your mind. I mean, it's just, it's so deep. This stuff goes so, so, so freaking deep in this concerted effort to keep us in this state that we're in. You know, hopefully we are, are going to get into like the nature of you know, humanity and consciousness and all that other stuff. We're so low level right now. We're so vibrating on such a, you know what I mean? The galactic empire, if there is one, it has to be looking at us like, these guys. Time to grow up, right? up. Get it together. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's crazy. I'm sorry. No, that's, that was, those are great points. And, and, you, and it's, that's exactly right. Is <clears throat> The eagle and the serpent, what it truly represents is duality at its finest. It is, are we controlled and conquered through our obsession with materialism, the physical world and war and empire building versus this, the serpent dragon, which represents not this demonized version that we've been told throughout history, right? And having the, the eagle be this, big, this great hero, but it represents um, the energetic um, nature of what, what makes up our reality and, and spirituality and consciousness and reaching higher states of knowledge. Enlightenment. And yeah, exactly. There, most of those things are non-physical. That's why I, I mentioned that it's like duality because it's these complete opposite traits that are basically competing against one another. And that's why Enlil versus Enki getting almost dual ownership over our reality and our, in our, in our world that's the reason why this division has gone back and forth so much. And I guess if we look around the world today, the Eagle has seemingly won and we've turned into this just conquering empire mentality where people's obsession have become just buying material goods and going into great debt and having to work their entire lives to pay it off. And before they know it, they're on their deathbed and they're wondering what they even spent their life doing instead of acquiring knowledge and these credible experiences and growing on a deep level, they're just, they have this empty in many cases and no disrespect to anyone, but they, in many cases, if you have this higher level look, it's this empty life where we don't really get much out of it other than like this seemingly um, quick pleasure that just to get us through each day. Right. Right. And immediate gratification kind of rules the day. And you yeah. said that in a lot of your work. And I mean, one time you kind of just kind of basically echoed what you just said. It's like you wake up in the morning you oftentimes, when I look at like LA traffic or big city traffic, I lived in Chicago and here in St. Louis, it's like, you go to work, you go sit in this thing for eight hours, you go home, you chill, maybe a couple hours, go to sleep and you do it again and again and again and again. And it's just, as like, it belies that larger question. I mean, and I've always, you know, we all have to make that decision of living a life versus making a living and all of that other stuff. But yeah, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. But that's the world we've all been you know, kids are shaming each other. Oh, you have an Android? What's wrong with you? I'm like, I have a freaking phone that has more tech. Even if I do have an Android, I have more technology in this phone that took, then supposedly took us to the moon if we went to the moon. You know what I mean? There's just, come on, man. We're just, we're really tramp. Like we've talked about it before. We trample people for Jordans and new clothes and Black Friday sales. It's all been engineered though. That's what's crazy. And to me, that's opinion. the lowest of the low, Jeffrey. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I, you know, and I know we're digressing a bit, but to me, if you look at the importance of humans, especially in what we're about to read in a second, and you look at what we are on a spiritual conscious level in the universe, and then you look at things like Black Friday videos of people getting trampled just to go in and buy these items that are on sale. Thanks. Thanks. It's, it's completely appalling to think that we've been misled so much to think that our fellow man is just you know, another animal that we can just fight over and it doesn't matter what we do, right? Or it's been a couple of years, but the guy who 
a group of guys who beat another guy to death in front of his kids at an NFL. It was like an opening day NFL game. Your, my team versus your team. One team lost, one team won. And somebody was beaten to death because of a difference of opinion on a freaking football team. That just shows you how far we've, we've fallen from grace and how, and how much this division, this you know, gladiator Roman Empire mentality of us all being distracted and competing and being ruled through all of these different coercive means that are done. Look at what we've become. And that's why I think it's so significant that these podcasts are, are being done by individuals like you, Jeffrey, because we're sitting here to discuss and try to break this, this system down that has forced people into this certain mindset that really diverts them from the truth. And at the same time, all these ancient sites are ignored and people think all this information is just a myth and none of it's real. And we, and we live in a very strange reality. If you really, if you really sit back it, and look it, and at it's it. The ma- I mean, it's, it, it's the matrix. It really is. It, it definitely is. So now let's connect that, uh, that, what we were talking about. Let's get back and talk about, well, what about the, the man, mankind's origin story? You know, what kind of information is there that really gives us some, some clues about how it actually started? Now, for people that I'm not going to be going over it right now, but for further information on that, I would highly recommend you check out uh, on my website. I have translations right on there, thestageoftime.com, where you can read about stories like the, the cuneiform tablets of the Atrahasis and Enuma Elish that really get into mankind's origin story and how we were actually created. But what we're going to be talking about today is the significance of the first man. And that is in, on a, in a biblical reference has been called Adam. But we have some completely different names that are used, which is, is funny because it's like you brought up with Noah. There are no cuneiform tablets anywhere that use the name Noah at all. His name is countless other names and tablets yeah. from Atrahasis to Zaya Sudra to Untapishti over and over again, there's all these names, but none of them are, are the ones that were used for biblical terms. So it's sort of, it's very interesting to me that these biblical stories that emerged and were taken from these earlier stories were woven so creatively to not only change the names, but to make them sound ridiculous so that we would never think that they're actually real. So, to the, uh, we're going to start with um, tablet one of the myth of, Ad- of Adapa. Now, Adapa is another name for Adam, who is also called Adamu. And it's another one of these cuneiform tablets that came out of um, the Babylon, Assyria area of Iraq. And, and what it s- states and starts by saying is, he, Adapa, possessed intelligence, his command like the command of Anu, he, the god Ea, granted him a wide ear to reveal the destiny of the land. There's that term destiny that's used everywhere. He granted him wisdom, but he did not grant him eternal life. In those days, in those years, the wise man of Eridu, Ea had created him as chief among men, a wise man whose command none shall oppose, the prudent, the most wise among the Anunnaki he was. Blameless, of clean hands, anointed, observer of the divine statutes. That's mind-blowing. Now let's break that down to show why it's mind-blowing because it might not always seem obvious to, to those who don't study this. But in, in the beginning, not only does it mention Adapa being this incredible being who was created by Ea, he created him, it says, as chief among men. So it's not like it's just this evolved ape thing. It's a direct creation. It says right in this, he was created by Ea to be superior. He was perfect. That's Ea with Ea being Enki. Yes. So thanks for clarifying. Ea was yet another name used for Enki. These, these gods, if you want to call them, or Anunnaki, which is the name that's used in Sumerian tablets to, to reference them, constantly talks about how we were created in their image. And I'm going to give a, take a brief second to, to read this because it correlates. But in, in Genesis 3.22, it states, Behold, the man has become one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and also take of the tree of life. So, one of us. Wait a minute. So, isn't Genesis supposed to be about God, this prime creator of everything, this, this singular individual? But yet, all these references that are hiding right in plain sight use this plural reference of us, which has also been called the Elohim, which is a plural reference, again, not a singular 
to these multiple individuals. Well, so I mean, Genesis I, even dabbles in stuff about giants too. So it's like he called them the Nephilim. Ex yes. Exactly. It, it, giants, right? So giant in stature or really physical giants. Well, right. that's what you have really have to look into and get into is that is if we are these descendants of the Anunnaki who are shown in cylinder seals and tablets everywhere, these, these incredibly tall beings who are much taller than, than we are now, then maybe that gives us some clues about how the Nephilim and these, and these ancient giants that are no longer here, you know, how they could have been so tall. So to continue to break this down, in, it mentions Eridu again. It says, it says um, in those days, in those years, the wise men of Eridu. So Adapa, this first man, this perfect man that we know is Adam in, in, in the biblical versions, he's living in Eridu. So that's where he's, he's living. That's, and that's, that shows you that that's where Eden is. This is the, literally the biblical ver location of where this story of Eden and this early creation of man, this is where it comes from. Now, uh, the, the line that to me is the most important of all is it says, the prudent, the most wise among the Anunnaki he was. So he is an Anunnaki. He is them. We are them. And that's what the whole story of this began with, is that he not only is the wisest among men, but he's the most superior among the Anunnaki. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, going through a lot of these different readings, uh, Zachariah Sitchin, et cetera, it's almost, I mean, they do this kind of genetic manipulation, and I don't know if this is exactly accurate or not, but they had different prototypes that weren't quite up to spec. And, you know, Adapa, Adamu, or Adam was the first one. It's like, all right. I mean, it's like when they first went through, got windows or whatever, they went through a lot of different technical issues to get to the windows they released to everybody for the masses to consume. And that's yeah. almost essentially a similar scenario. Exactly. That, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because that's the differentiation because he's not the first ruler of Eridu. Aluim is now, but he's greater than Aluim. And Aluim is reported to have ruled for thousands of years. So how is he greater? Well, some of these other kings had long reigns because the, supposedly these, the Anunnaki bloodlines were literally immortal. And that's why their descendants could live so long. But so why was Adapa so superior? Well, it says he's the most superior among the Anunnaki. This is where... The, the competition and the hatred from Enlo comes in. This is where it begins. Because what happened? We were supposed to be created as workers in the physical realm on earth because for the gods, working for the gods so that they didn't have to toil, they called it, in our reality any longer. We were created in their image to do the work. But the problem was we were supposed to be primitive, unaware workers. Well, what did Enki do? Well, he's He's a master geneticist. He's a master at knowledge and wisdom and understanding everything in the universe, basically, is, is what it describes as. And so what did he do? Well, he took this as, a, as a, um, a moment to truly prove himself, and he created a perfect being, a perfect being that's even greater than them. And they are basically became non-physical beings that could physically incarnate if they wanted to, but they basically conquered reality and conquered mortality. And yet this being who was created, Adapa, was superior to them. And I think that's where this whole thing started yes. about yeah. how we became hated and we became de-evolved over time through all the different divisions that were created because- well were threatened by us, weren't they? Well, yeah, and it, 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 it all makes so much sense why, why there had to be this story of original sin, which yes. necessitated this begotten son of God to come absolve us losers because we dared to eat of the tree of life, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, that, that, that begets kind of a larger conversation of like, you know, a good Christian doesn't question anything. I mean, they just keep you in the box, dude. And if you question anything, you're doing bad things and you're going to die. And I mean, wow. So it's mind blowing. So it is, it is, it is. And it's, it's again, by design, it, just over a thousand, I mean, over, geez, such a long, long time, such a long, and the level of sophistication of it as well. I mean, whew. well, just think about it. So we, it, what sophistication is right. 
most people don't know, but we have these energetic chakra centers along our spine that basically their vibrational frequency, what we see as, as light, they exactly match every single color in the visible light spectrum on a vibrational level. So for instance, what does that mean? If, if someone is, they're, they're becoming a really good person, they're helping other people, they're, they're digging into ancient history, they're getting enormous amounts of wisdom, they're meditating, they're becoming highly conscious. Well, what happens? It's not like it, you do that and nothing happens. Something, something happens to genetically within us, to our vibrational level, something occurs. And what happens is your root chakra, your red root chakra, your lowest state that you can possibly exist in, you're, you're all of a sudden you break out of that because your vibrational frequency increases and you move to the next vibrational frequency levels. And if, if people look, how many chakras do we have in our body? Seven. How many colors are in the visible light spe spectrum? Seven. Of those colors in the visible light spectrum, if you break them down to a vibrational level, they exactly match our chakras, which means- When you blew my mind when we first talked, because I first alluded to the matrix and the analogy of the matrix, and I'm like, yeah, everybody gets red pill, but yeah, you're like, you'd be like, but red pill is your lowest, and blue, red is supposedly be, being awakened, and blue is supposedly, you know, being closed minded. But in fact, you know, blue is the, the highest level of awareness. I found that interesting as well. Thank Ooh. you for bringing that up, Jeffrey. Now, some people may be mad at me for for talking about this because so many people love that term. Yo, you got to get it's red everywhere, pilled, right? You got to be yeah. red pilled, red pilled, red pilled. Well. The Matrix is a great movie, okay? It has so much truth, but that doesn't mean that everything is always um, exactly truthful. There are deceptions that exist everywhere. And one of those deceptions is with those colors, like you mentioned, the Matrix, because if our red chakra is our root chakra, our most basic chakra, our most basic level of consciousness is red. That's what, go look up, go look up what chakra colors are and go look at what they each represent and look at the vibrational levels. You see that being kept in your red chakra, red pill would mean being asleep because it would mean you be, be kept in your lowest possible state of awareness. Whereas blue is the, is the second highest level you could reach in your vibrational frequency. Purple would be only the highest level, but that would represent all the colors combined to reach the highest stage, which would basically is this truly enlightened state of reaching your highest level. So when the term blue and red pilled, you're right, it's blue pilled would really mean waking up because you'd be reaching this higher state of awareness and all of a sudden all these things that have seemingly kept you distracted and you couldn't- Which is just together. so fascinating, even within that freaking huge, in my opinion, nugget of truth, which yeah. I think is the matrix, they slip in that, if you're aware, and I think it almost happens on a subconscious, unconscious level, that that color- it's they slip in that little bit of inversion back to the bad, not bad side, but you know what I mean? Just that color reversal. Yeah. Well, well, what do, what do red and blue represent? Everything, political divisions, um, countries, every, red and blue are the most common two colors that exist on flags and crests across the world. Red and blue literally is the great war here. You, Crips we and mentioned, bloods, baby. Crips and bloods. We I mean, men you a, mentioned you know. eagle versus a serpent. You could say red would be the eagle and blue would be the serpent. It's the same thing. It's duality. It's the exact same thing. Red would be being kept in your lowest state where you're fighting over war and materialism and conquering the physical world, but being kept in a low state of consciousness and not spiritual and not connecting to this higher state that's all around us. Whereas the serpent and dragon with this blue color would represent reaching your highest state. It now is, look again, at the an interesting. Interesting dichotomy. I mean, we're not dichotomy, but here we are rocking the red, white, and blue. You know what I mean? That's right. That's right. Red, white, and blue. What's white? It's all the colors. It is all color. So it, once you start breaking this stuff down, it really starts to blow your mind because it's hiding in plain sight all around us. The Freemasons, one of the oldest secret societies on earth be, before it became corrupted eventually, their primary color was blue. And there's no, there's no, it's not, there's no coincidence in that. The blue, that's always represented these higher and lower states. Um, and I, and I, I'm fascinated by that because we exist in this incredible dualistic world where these symbols are sort of hiding in plain sight all around us. And, and we're in many cases, we're not willing to accept um, certain aspects of information because we've been deceived for so long. So I want to read um, 
to be, I want to read the, the tablet two of the myth of Adapa and we'll discuss, and then we'll sort of close out with just, with just some, some closing statements about discussing this, but tablet two states, and it continues on from what I read before. Let someone bring Adapa to me. Adapa, before the face of Anu the king, thou art to go to heaven. Isn't that interesting? It predates the Bible by thousands of years, and it has the same type of, type of words used in, in type of references. The road to heaven he made him take, and to heaven he ascended. When he came to heaven, he approached the door of Anu. Why has Ea revealed to impure mankind the heart of heaven and earth? A heart he has created within him has made him a name. Now thou shalt not live. Ea, my Lord, said, eat not, drink not of eternal life. Take him and bring him back to earth. And I'm, I'm of course, paraphrasing because those tablets are much longer than that. But basically what that's stating is, okay, so heaven is a real place. It's not just a place that we think of as heaven and earth is a state of mind. But in this case, heaven is referring to higher realms. That's, that's what this is referring to, higher realms. So he, uh, Anu, if you look into Anu, he is essentially this hierarchy ruler of all of these Anunnaki, okay? And those temples, I, I want to just go back. The temples I mentioned, the Inanna's temples that were in um, Eridu and in Iraq, those are basically the temples to An, Anu, to, to worshiping him. Now, it mentions that he refuses immortality and that he's cast down and, and brought back to earth. Back to earth. Not just a state of mind, but he's literally brought back to this realm after and he becomes mortal. And it states that after that, mankind became mortal forever. So we're, we see that there's these really interesting events that occurred where mankind used to live for incredible amounts of time and have all of these different dynastic bloodline connections back to the Anunnaki. But over time and through disasters and cataclysms that I firmly believe the cataclysms that occurred, what was called the Younger Dryas, this period of during when the last ice age ended and these disasters and great deluge just mentioned nearly everywhere. I believe that created a great reset button in humanity. And, and after that point, we had to start over completely. And that's where you see a lot of these Mesopotamian, this might help people understand, that's where you see a lot of these Mesopotamian cities rebuilt and relived in and other cities emerging after. Because there's, just like in Egypt and just like in other parts of the world, like in the Inca Empire, up through the Aztec and Maya, there were different epics of human history that were wiped out by great disasters where they had to completely restart. And I just want to mention one more thing, Jeffrey, before you jump in. Probably the number, number one piece of evidence to find that. The number one thing that really stands out is Machu Picchu in, in Peru. Because in Machu Picchu, you see this incredible building from those ancient cultures, these massive blocks, perfectly carved. And then on top of it, are, is this all this primitive building, rock and this mortar and this really small cobble rocks. Go look at photographs right now of those different, of those, of Machu Picchu and those different walls. And you instantly will see them if you know what you're looking for. And like what that basically is proving is that instead of us having this narrative of us slowly evolving and becoming more sophisticated over time, which would be the more advanced building would be on the top and the primitive would be in the bottom. It's totally backwards. Right. And you know, cause you interviewed Brian Forster who talks all about this, but basically that proves that we used to be far more sophisticated and then we became primitive. It was like we had to be amnesia. And we got completely reset. Well, and we've even uh, interviewed uh, Randall Carlson, who spoke very, very in depth about the younger Dryas. I mean, in, in this, even geologically, they hide these certain things that, that ha that have happened that have reshaped everything and it's you know you're going back to your you know your audra haces etc that same narrative is in you know the, the 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 narrative of the flood is what i mean and it goes back to you know epic of gilgamesh your audra haces these narratives are there all of these different these symbols of these stories just go back so far but aren't they just myths yeah i know that's what i'm saying and when you see them show up in all these different places i mean it's just like people you gotta start asking like what what is exactly going on? And I know we're not going to get into it tonight, and, but how they, how they hide the timeline on these things. Like, it's just, you know, even the first city on, 
again, I, I started out with this, ladies and gentlemen, and let, let go to Matthew LaCroix's work, The Illusion of Us, Stage of Time, listen and let this stuff resonate and then ask yourself wow that's so weird look at where we've been at war in spending trillions of dollars for the last 20 years and not only just that look at when the iraq war kicked off where did they go immediately to the museum of antiquity yes that none of this is an accident, in my humble opinion. And the, the, what you're telling me is, and what you know, your work suggests and other people's work suggests, I mean, there's a lot of investment, if you will, a lot of interest in keeping us, keeping up with the Kardashians, whether it's identity politics, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you start really, uh, you know, understanding the things Matthew's saying and what, what this evidence suggests, not only just this civilization, it's happened time and time again. But they feed us this nonsense. Like you said, like we were just morons and we grew into these awesome human beings we are now. Yeah, it, well said. I mean, and, and so for those who are watching this on YouTube um, and those who aren't, I can at least describe it. The image that I have while we're talking is what's known as a ziggurat of Eridu. And it is the location of where er Eridu is. It's not like this is a mythological city and it's not real and, and, and we don't know anything about it. We know exactly where it was. The um, Iraqi uh, antiquities and uh, other institutions from um, England, University of Oxford, they went and they found Eridu. They used old information from tablets, but hey, that's a myth, right? They used old information from tablets and they went and they, and they marked basically and said, okay, so the Euphrates River is here and the Tigris River is here and the Persian Gulf is right here. This is supposed to be where Eridu was. And they drive out in the desert with jeeps and they go and they find it. They find the city and they, and they find the ziggurat of, of Eridu, which I'm showing right now. And they find the, the mountain of me, like I mentioned the story, this, this mountain that used to have a great temple on top of it. They walk around, they see, they see pieces of stone walls sticking out and you can find images of that, it's absolutely incredible. Pieces of the old wall just sticking out of the sand in the desert, just, just protruding out covered in layers and layers and layers of thousands well, of years of sand. And you said before we went on, you're like, do you see any gates around that? You see any security guards? Like, do you see anything that draws attention? Like, hey, this is Eridu. Like, nope, it's, they just make it seem like these are just mounds in the desert. You know, nothing to see here. So literally the most important ancient site in human history, the location yeah. of Eden, the first man, the creation of mankind in perfection, the gods living here, the first city ever created. And instead of being memorialized, it's just sitting left abandoned in the middle of the desert in a war zone so that nobody can go investigate it. Nobody can go look at it. To me, it doesn't get more obvious than that. And people will go, well, why would they do that? Well, if, if you had Eridu and people could go visit it and they start reading about it and it's in all these tablets talking about how it's the first city ever that might bring up some really serious questions that people would start asking, wouldn't they, Jeffrey? Yeah, I mean, because then, I mean, we're going to get into it when we, when we are on Sam's show. I know our time's limited now, but, you know, this notion, you know, oh, no, this is all, you know, Islamic, goat effing, yeah, blah, 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 blah. You know, Islam didn't, wasn't around until the 7th century AD. We're talking way, way, way before that. And I cannot wait to get into the conversation about Cyrus the Great, Darius, uh, Parasopolis. I mean, why, gee, why did Alexander burn down Parasopolis? Hmm, why did they burn down Alexandria? I mean, what are they hiding from us, guys? Over and over again, it seems like history tries to get erased by the conquerors, doesn't it? And that's always how it is, man. And again, they, we all know it, you know, that to the history, to the, to the winners goes the spoils and not just the spoils, but how they then move forward defining history. You know, they get to define the narrative on what, you know, who won, who lost, which is just, you know, we're all kind of of this, and I don't mean to digress too much or whatever, but the, the, we're all of this kind of Greco-Roman ancient history thing. And we look at, you know, we look at the Persians, they're savages, et cetera, et cetera. Excuse me, sir. Look up and go check out Parasopolis, if you will. Look up Susa. I mean, come on. We, we got to start giving, you know, credit where credit's due. The concept of zero, algebra. This came from this civilization. Yeah, it's it, all, all this knowledge that we have today of mathematics and astronomy and agriculture and social laws and, and money. Everything came from Mesopotamia. Everything. And that really just shows you where these divine um, 
these organers of destinies, as they call themselves, you know, handing all this down to create civilizations, it all makes sense when you actually connect those pieces. And you see that it's been a, a war back and forth throughout history for certain individuals to control the narrative and fighting over what this future of humanity is going to go. Jeffrey, I want to um, close out there because I feel like we've had a really good discussion today. Of course. But why always. don't you go ahead and um, just, you know, call out what your um, awesome podcast that you do is and any information mm. you want to give. Yeah. And check us out. The conspiracy farm.com myself and Pat Melitich, you know, we, I mean, this is, we talk about a little bit of everything and just because a lot of certain topical conversations are pretty relevant, we do talk about it. But again, a lot of them beget that white noise of, of right versus left. Is Donald Trump a white hat? Ooh, the, the, the attack on uh, Soleimani in Iran, was that Rouhani consolidating power or him and Trump on the same side? You know what I mean? Just the, the level of disinformation and misinformation that goes out about all of this stuff, which we're going to be hearing a mo lot more of as we go to the 2020 election. It just, it just exacerbates that whole Pepsi challenge that we're all in, that binary thought process, right versus left. And it just, like, as we just articulate this whole thing, just keeps us arguing while these, whatever you want to call them, they at the top, keep us fighting while the, the train goes in the same direction, doing the same stuff. And we're so far, you know, we're so far beyond here in this country, even kind of beginning to understand that we could possibly be in this area at war for more than just oil, natural resources. This again is Alexander or the Romans trying to rewrite history. And what have they been doing? Destroying these, these means of antiquity, these, these, you know, these, these objects of antiquity, statues, whatever, text, uniform text. So I'm so glad, bro, that you invited me on keep killing it with your show. I'm always welcome or I'm always thankful to come back on or talk to you. And we did talk off air about a, another bit of huge business that have happened. That would be absolutely amazing. But again, thank you, Matthew, for your work. Um, and for me, you can check us out. The, uh, the conspiracy farm. We'll be talking uh, a little bit of everything, but this honestly has become one of my favorite, favorite subjects because it transcends a little bit of everything. So again, brother, love you like midnight loves the moon, man. Happy new year to everybody. And, um, Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. You too. Um, and, and those who are interested, um, please check out my website at thestageoftime.com. And you can find my, the two books that I've written um, on there. And uh, the Stage of Time includes a lot of these ancient translations and cuneiform tablets. So you have a place to just go in there and be able to read them and have them. And rather than having to search around the internet and not know where to look. Um, and my, I have a YouTube page as well at Matthew LaCroix. And I really want to just just say one more time, I truly appreciate everyone that supports my work and supports Jeffrey. We are um, the pioneers in the front lines trying to spread truth and awareness and break this paradigm of deception that's controlled us for so long. So thanks so much, everyone.